I would like to warmly welcome Professor Abhijit Banerjee. It's the most uh, important topic which we are all um, concerned about, interested in, and wanting to learn from you, sir. Thank you so much for agreeing to be present. And I'm sure with the kind of attendees which we are seeing, it will be a very interactive session. And I always enjoyed uh, every one of your talks, whether it's in India or abroad. And uh, it's uh, great to hear you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Before I proceed to begin the evening, dear friends and colleagues across our campuses and the public, I must acknowledge in the words of T.S. Eliot, you say I'm repeating. You say I'm repeating something I have said before. I shall say it again. So let me repeat what I have said before at Professor Rajni Kothari's series talks. We have assembled here to celebrate works of Professor Rajni Kothari and his inspiring civic activism, and also TISS excellence in promoting people-centered education, not for glory and list of all for profit, but to create out of the materials of the human spirit, something which did not exist before uh, to confront the challenges of our times. On behalf of the Institute, we are honored to have with us today, our chairman, Mr. Subramaniam Ramadurai Saab, India's iconic technocrat and innovator under whose guidance this has scaled new heights of academic excellence and public activism. I also thank our director, Professor Salni Bharat, a widely reputed social scientist in the, health, in the areas of health studies, who has really led us from the front in these difficult pandemic times. Professor Banerjee, Abhijit Banerjee, I'm really grateful to you. And I express it with all frankness and with the conversational tone that it was really amazing the way with the ease and the grace you accepted our invitation. It mm. speaks so highly of your commitment to democratic education and inclusive public sphere of debate and discussion. We are all familiar with your path-breaking works across economics and public policy. None has expressed the power, the honesty, and the deeply felt emotions of economics better than you, Professor Banerjee. And some who is famous for saying on the lighter note, I'm quoting you, who is famous for saying on the lighter note that all I do is plumbing and economics. May I welcome the plumber, the greatest plumber in economics from the past, and today, with the lab today in the present, you know. I'm sure uh, students and colleagues across all campuses and centers uh, will enjoy your discussion and your talk today. Uh, talk, what talk in what great Indian poet, Jivananananda said, you know, experience the scent of sunlight. I repeat what the Jivananananda said, scent of sunlight, a surreal, surreal quest for truth and freedom, you know, talk today, Professor Banerjee. In the blue of midnight, Professor Banerjee, and in the dark days too, you have shown yourself again and again in unbounded splendor of the power of education in healing the wounds of a time. I formally welcome you, Professor Banerjee, and I would like to invite now our director, Professor Salni Bharat, to formally and officially give a welcome speech for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, Mr. Ramadurai, my faculty colleagues from across campuses, students and participants from India and abroad. It's my immense pleasure to welcome one of the greatest economists, winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics 2019 and a prominent activist academics of our time, Professor Abhijit Banerjee. We are delighted and honored to have him speak at the Professor Rajni Kothari lecture series of the Tata Institute of Social Sciences this evening. I'm very grateful to you, Professor Banerjee, for taking time off from your busy schedule to deliver, deliver your talk titled, Every Child Counts Towards a More Democratic Education. The Professor Rajini Kothari lecture series is anchored at the Center for Public Policy, Habitat, and Human Development of the School of Development Studies at TIS since 2016. It draws inspiration from the scholarly works and civic activism of Professor Kothari a celebrated political scientist, author of the classic Politics in India, and founder of the Center for the Study of Developing Societies and Lokine. The lecture series at TIS 
is conceptualized and curated by Professor Ashwini Kumar, a former student of Professor Kothari, and includes a set of interactive panel discussions and talks with some of the most distinguished thinkers, scholars, and artists in India and abroad. Friends, as you all know, Professor Banerjee, jointly with Esther Dufflo and Michael Kremer, is the recipient of the 2019 Severus Risk Bank Prize in Economic Sciences established in the memory of Alfred Nobel. The three economists were awarded this highest recognition for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. I'm grateful to Professor Banerjee for accepting our invite and agreeing to share with us his insights into their pioneering work that revolutionized the concept of poor economics. Using the experimental research approach and employing the randomized controlled trial design, the trials field work in many underprivileged regions has demonstrated novel ways to tackling poverty. Professor Banerjee, the RCT design and development economics has triggered much interest within the TIS research community, especially among some of those, including me from the public health field who are very familiar with RCT design in research on HIV, reproductive health, health financing, among other topics. Today, when the concerns of justice and fairness have become especially paramount in the context of the global pandemic crisis, the work of Professor Banerjee has acquired great relevance as well as urgency. Helping national and global economies to flourish again also means the flourishing of humankind in just and equitable manner. We must do whatever we can to help people help themselves. And for this, we turn to Professor Banerjee to guide us in making the post-COVID world far more secure, safer, and humane. And this means taking the road less traveled, as the poet Robert Frost famously said, and hoping this leads to beginning of a new tomorrow without the fear or discriminations of any kind. I thank my colleagues, students, and staff of the School of Development Studies for organizing this wonderful lecture series and giving us the opportunity to listen to one of those rare economists and social scientists who have combined experimental rigor with a heartfelt concern for the poor and the marginalized. May I now call upon Professor Banerjee to deliver his talk. Professor Banerjee. Thank you, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you to Professor Kumar for his rather unique uh, approach to introductions. I, I, um, I will remember if I'm ever invited to speak at this again that I have to come with some poetry. Um, I, uh, Professor Kumar was um, maybe surprised by how quickly I responded to his invitation, but I think that was inspired by two, two things. One, he, he mentioned uh, the names of two of my heroes, Ashish Nandi and Rajni Kothari. I never met Professor Kothari in my life, but I knew him for many, many years as uh, one of the two people along with my former colleague, Myron Wiener, as being the founders of empirical political science research in India. I think these were the two pioneers of, of doing field-based empirical research in political science in India. And I read their work for now uh, longer than I care to admit almost, it, it will date me. Um, along with that, however, I, I think what, in, what also made it you know, incumbent on me to give this talk is uh, if, when invited was the name of TIS, which is an institution that we, we in our community honor in part by just for being just this, the source of so many of our colleagues in the in Poverty Action Lab and people, fabulous people who keep our organization going. So I, I, I have a great, great deal of gratitude to your organization. Thank you. With that, let me, let me get into my talk. Um, let's see if this works. Um, so I, I guess the, the pandemic is, uh, it's going to be as usual, um, is a, a massive challenge um, which we haven't yet uh, quite dealt with. 
I think that's a, a fa it's fair to say we're sort of in the middle of it. Um, the schools are still closed mostly. Um, in India, I would say has been more slower than other countries in reopening schools. Pakistan has reopened its schools many months ago. Um, we have not, and we are we are still um, still I think debating. Now this is this is uh, potentially um, frightening because we already know there is massive inequalities. Um, there are, there's a set of people who, including Professor Pranab Barthan, who's a friend of Dr. Ashish Nandi, who who have been long arguing that the real inequality in India is education inequality. That's where India is really among the world's most unequal. And if, from that respect, I think this is going to be a, an even bigger challenge because as this slide says, 28% of Indian households had internet that's usable for uh, so any kind of broadband. Uh, uh, not on phones, but if you leave out phones, only 28% of Indian households have internet. And to actually substitute for, um, for uh, live classes, you really need something more than uh, just a small phone. So I think that's, that's uh, obviously one reason why this is going to be a moment where we need to take stock. We need to think about how we will reopen. To you know, partly within with the challenge of uh, maybe undoing the inequality consequences of this episode uh, as fast as possible, if possible. Now, it's a. This is starts from, and that's mostly what I'm going to talk about, since the educational piece of the pandemic has almost, is only beginning to be studied. So I think that's probably not where most of the, most of the, uh, I can't, there's not much I can say about it. I mean, my guess is that it's not a wonderful thing, but um, I'll say a little bit more about it later. But the problem is actually well known even before the, the pandemic, there was, that there was a problem that we have in a sense, and that's even recognized by in the new uh, economic education policy document that came out this year. So there is a the recognition that there's both high enrollment in schools, but first low attendance, children are come to school in some states as few as 50% of the time and low learning levels. This, this, this is being now hammered home in particular by the Asser report, which all of you know about, the wonderful report that that the Pratham has pioneered. This this has hammered home, and I'll show you some more data from that. Um, but you probably sadly know this data. It's in the front page of the newspaper every year, and every year it looks maybe equally dire. Um, so this is from from the uh, Asser report. Um, 96.7% of children in the 6 to 14 age group are enrolled in school. This is, this is now we can take it as given, though I think that it's a concern that we should go back to because I think the longer children are out of school, the less they're likely to go back. That's all, that correlation also exists. So we should worry about whether this will be still true when we reopen. Um, Nonetheless, on average, only 71% of the enrolled children, which is less than 70% of all the children, are attending school on a given day. So that's that, that's a that's a low number. And there are states where that number is extremely low. Yeah, you can see that um, that number in West Bengal, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh is less than 60%. So that's, a, that's children 
are in school, but they're not coming. And that's, I'll come back to why they're not coming. I don't think there's a mystery to why they're not coming. Uh, uh, but I think that it's, it's a fact that then explains why, well, or not explains or is explained by, uh, is both related to this fact that about 50%, but not quite, of students in class five can read at least at class two level. That's a fact that uh, has been, uh, you know, is in the front page of the newspaper every year you know, when Asar comes out in January, but is it's at some level, it's, it's we have sort of uh, got inured to it. It's, it's a shocking fact. It's, it's a fact that, you know, because the standard that we are aspiring to is so at odds with what we are obs observing here. And that's at the heart of, heart of the crisis of education is this fact, which is that you have a bunch of ch children who um, are in school, but for whom school is increasingly meaningless because they are um, they're behind. The classes are not uh, delivering to them what they need to get. And uh, they are, uh, and they are therefore at risk of dropping out. So the part of the reason why children don't come to school almost surely is that school is uh, unpleasant because they go there without connecting to what's being done in class because they are behind. And once you're that far behind, it's it's very hard to appreciate what's being done in class. So I think that they go to school for whatever other reasons, but the pleasure of learning is hardly one of them. So that, that, that and it cuts both ways, of course. And if you don't go to school, then you don't learn. So I think this, this is well understood and well known. Um, the same is true in math. These are numbers for math. Um, you know, 44% of class eight students, as class eight, can do, you know, 869 divided by seven. That's a, that's a, that's a very, uh, that's, that's a fact that when we talk about the demographic dividend, we talk about, you know, India's youth dividend, we should think about the, the this sort of picture of the youth. I think that they are unable to divide 869 by seven. These are in class eight. They're not going to learn that after class eight. So whatever we're doing, this is sort of a shocking gap in between that and our, and our aspiration. Um, yeah. Now, I think it's worth being uh, sort of being clear that this is not, I think it's e easy to, I think, I think we have a tendency often to, to try to sweep this away to say that we have so many problems, how can you expect this? And I, I want to start I, to, to make this talk useful. I think we need to deal with those claims. The first claim I want to deal with is teacher salaries. Teachers are, uh, you know, teachers are not paid as much as they're paid in, in Germany. That's correct. But relative to GDP, India pays its teachers more than any OECD country. Relative to per capita GDP, we are the highest paying country, not the lowest. You know, it's, and in some sense, you, you have to, think of the per capita GDP as a scaling of what other jobs are worth. And so in some sense, relative to what the opportunities are, it, a teacher is very, very well paid in India. So that's a fact that, and um, now what makes that doubly, uh, doubly uh, uh, depressing is that in fact, there are teachers who are not paid a lot. These are uh, contract teachers. And to the extent that we have any evidence on this, this one randomized control trial, and it suggests that those teachers are not less effective than the fully paid teachers, perhaps more. Um, there's other evidence um, from, from uh, Indonesia, 
uh, and in Kenya, where basically they doubled or increased teacher pay by a huge amount and found no evidence that it improves uh, school outcomes. And I'll come back to this point. I think in some ways this problem of, of low learning is very much there in uh, rest of the world as well. It's not just that in this, not in India's, it's not India's problem, it's a problem of many developing countries. East Africa looks, if anything, worse than us. West Africa looks, if anything, worse than us. Pakistan looks like us. Um, many countries look the same. Learn, school, children are school, but are not really learning. Um, another fact, which is uh, perhaps even more uh, sort of taken as given, is that class size does not have an, any impact. So we, we did an experiment now 20, almost 20 years ago with Pratham, but that, that kind of thing has been done many times now of cutting class size. We, in our case, the class, class size was cut by 50%. That had no effect on the children who were uh, in the half size class. So that's, a, that's an index of, uh, but these were randomized control trials. There were, uh, so there was no, we were not comparing somehow small classes in one place with big class another. These were all either in Mumbai city or in, in, in Baroda. And in both cases, we found no impact of cutting class size. So and this, is, this has actually been done many times now in many countries. And again, very similar fact, which is that the class size doesn't seem to matter. So it's not, in other words, the most obvious resources other than I think having a school is, having access to a school is valuable. That's well established, it's true in India. In fact, you know, getting to school, so if you, uh, if you just think of, um, you know, for what, how difficult it is often for um, teenage girls to go to school, if you provide a school that, a cycle to them so that they can go to school. This is evidence from Bihar showing that that increases education. So school is good, but beyond that, we, we aren't paying teachers too little. We are not or any obvious way. We are not, our class sizes actually, if anything, the, the concern, which in the, in the, for example, the new education policy articulates is our class sizes in many government schools is too small that in a sense, children, between children not attending and people, children moving to government school, private schools, in a lot of schools, uh, the class sizes are so tiny that the school becomes unsustainable. So we are we're really, whatever, the, uh, whatever our prejudices be, is not these, these standard problems of underpaid teachers and uh, poor, you know, to, to two large classes. There are places where the classes are enormous in UP, for example, but for most of India, this is not a problem. And the problems of low learning are not concentrated in UP. They're true everywhere. There is another line of attack on this, which is uh, teacher incentives. So you can get teach teachers uh, to focus on particular outcomes by improving incentives and you get small benefits from it on the outcomes that you target. It's not, however, one thing that's very, very, very striking is that private schools where teachers actually face extremely strong incentives. They get fired easily. Private schools in India, the average private school, which is a, uh, a low uh, fee private school in a slum or a, or a village are, are sort of a cutthroat world where you know, the schools shut down often. They, they, have, they, they have low fees, low teacher pay, and teachers are fired at will. In those schools where teachers have very strong incentive to improve um, outcomes, uh, there is no evidence that uh, once you control properly for the fact that 
children from more privileged families go to private schools and you control for that properly. For example, in a randomized control trial where you give some children vouchers to go to private school, you find no systematic difference between these schools. So private schools for the same child, a private school is not obviously better. Um, so the, you can, these are results from, uh, from the, the uh, Murali Dharan and Sundar Raman experiment in Andhra Pradesh. And you can see that basically uh, the test score, uh, what you make of the test scores uh, difference depends a bit on how much weight you put on English. They do worse in math and worse in telecom the private school students. So when you get a voucher, you go to a private school. Now, this is, uh, you could try to you know, rescue this by saying, well, if they went to a different kind of private school or uh, they must be the right kind of private school. I, I'm, I, I won't say that this is the end of that uh, conversation. You could make arguments that go the other way. But I think a fact that we already knew is that if you just compare private schools with with, uh, with um, children from the same family who go to private schools with the children from that family who go to government schools. And that's probably not, they're not probably exactly comparable because pr probably the one who goes to private school also gets time to do homework and the other one, his sister probably gets, has to wash the dishes instead. So you, when you do that comparison, the differences you observe are already small. So you don't, even, even if you don't, uh, so I think we knew this, and this is sort of confirmed by the data that there isn't big effects of private schools. So that's this is all to say that the obvious, you know, private school will save us. Teachers, we just have to pay better teachers better, and that you know we just have to cut class size and hire more teachers. None of these by itself will work. I think that that's something we've sort of learned. Um, now, there is always the other explanation, which is that Indian children, by the time they are six, they, are, they don't have enough, enough uh, nutrition, they, 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 they are malnutrited, they're not, uh, they don't have enough um, you know, childhood uh, support of different kinds, early childhood is important. All of those are true. Nonetheless, here's a study that uh, Esther Duflo and a bunch of others did. And what they did was they did the same thing in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where is, which is where MIT and Harvard is, and in uh, the slums of Delhi. Okay? And these are with children who are usually three and four, who are pre-mathematic, but who can do, who can recognize shapes, who can recognize, who can sort shapes, who can do all kinds of what we would call non-symbolic math, not math with one, two, three, four, but math with fig objects. They can do that. And so they tested uh, where, uh, these children in the slums of Delhi and in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts being the home to Harvard and MIT is full of ch the children in, these, in the schools in Cambridge, Massachusetts tend to be from very privileged families. Their parents have PhDs, their parents are, you know, PhD students, they're professors. So these are the ultra privileged children in a, in a much richer country. And the striking fact is that if you look at these children, there's no difference in the performance. They're just as good Indian children at age four in the slums of Delhi are just as good at sorting, sorting between um, shapes and counting shapes and putting them into a different, uh, they do it as fast, they do it as well. So there is no difference between them. So I, 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 this is good news. This is saying we are not handicapped. Despite, uh, I think we, we do handicap our children in many ways, but I think we handicap them in ways that are social rather than physiological. I think we are, our children are still able to do the math. We then, what we do with them is where we fail. So here's an example of that. I want to just uh, emphasize this same point. The children have talent, which we don't use. So this is a study we did in Kolkata and Delhi across a um, bunch of markets. 
what did we do? We sent uh, mystery shoppers to shop. They were not, they were just literally shoppers. They went with usually with 200 rupees and we were told to buy two goods and not half kilo, 200 grams of carrots and 300 grams of peas or 200 grams of onions and 400 grams of beets or whatever. Some, we gave them very clear instructions that don't make it too simple. Then after that, and I'll tell you what we found. So they went to buy and then they gave them usually 100 or 200 rupees. Uh, and they got the change back. These were children who were selling and they gave the change back. Then after this happened, they were invited to um, do uh, an Asar type math problem, the pro exactly like I showed you before, 892 divided by seven, that kind of math problem. And they were uh, done, given some oral math as well, including some problems that look very much like like the problems that they were solving in the market, but also somewhat more slightly altered. So they were given oral mathematics problems or, and, uh, and then and written mathematics problems. And uh, these were, and so we could, for the same child, and we could do it, we did it both ways. So some children were asked the math problem first and then um, somebody else went to his, them to shop from them and the other way around. So uh, these, were, these were done carefully to see if there is any, we're making some mistake. Now the, I, the answer is very, very stable. Uh, I, let me just tell you a little bit about these kids. These kids are mostly boys. They are, um, they have mostly attended school. They have, um, mostly sell goods by kilo. We didn't manage to get all, we would like to have had all of them sell by kilo, but some of them sell by piece, etc. Still, there's some math involved. If you have to take six bananas, you still have to multiply or so, something. Um, and they are mostly still in school. They are usually in sixth or seventh grade. Um, these were the, I already showed you this, I'll skip this. These are the Asar type problems. So here's the first fact, which is that the, these children, they do much worse. The market children do much worse in school math. When you give them school math, they do much worse. I'll tell you what's going happening in a minute. I come back to it because um, sort of interesting to get the texture of it. but. So um, Asa divides people by the, the most difficult thing they can do. So the school children are in Delhi. These are in, in schools in Delhi where they are um, schools. And I for, forgive me, I, I have no control over the siren that's going outside. So you probably hear it, but I, you know, there is something happening outside. And you can see. So I was saying that a lot more children in the schools, very similar neighborhood uh, schools uh, in Delhi were able to do the school math. And I, I was, I will, I'll tell you a little bit about why, why I think this happens, but right now take it as a fact. Now, what's interesting is the school children were also asked to do the market problems. So they were given where we created fake markets for them, where we went and shopped, where we gave them these plastic vegetables to sell. It was a little insulting, but they, they took it in good spirit, I would say. So the market children basically um, do much, much better at the market transactions. Even though they cannot do the school math at all, uh, they are, they're better than the school children, in fact, I think after the first time when, when they got, I think a little, um, I don't know, there was a, maybe a, they, they got frazzled by 
the you know the the person demanding is changed too quickly that they they actually got used to it and 95% of the time they they give the correct change back and uh, so they were they were much much better than the school school children so um, in other words it is and the school children actually were and this is actually overestimating how well the children did the school children did the school children were really not able to do this mentally they just couldn't do it where if you ask somebody to do how much does 200 grams of carrots plus at 60 rupees plus uh, 300 grams of beets at 70 rupees work out to um, almost none of them could do it uh, mentally, they had to, so they wrote long, complicated, uh, rep repeated editions and things like that to do it. So it was really a very different experience. The market children could do it within a few seconds. So in other words, it was not, and then in fact, to cross check, what we did was, is we actually gave the school, school children and the market children sort of very similar problems to solve. And the more similar these problems are to the market problems, the, the better the school market children do. And then just to in, investigate, I, I, was, I was there, I was asking these kids, you know, um, to the, often the asar questions. And one of the kids, I think, I think made it very clear. So he, as soon as I showed him the division problem, he said, I can't do that. Even though he was doing to do the market problem, you have to do division and multiplication. That's how you get, you're doing the unitary method. Um, when we asked him, why can't you do it? He said, look, if I could do it, I would be in school. And the, the, the reason why, and then we said, well, keep trying, why don't you try? So he started to write down a division problem, but, and he knew that somehow you want to write numbers below other numbers, but he didn't know whether to write on the right or the left. So in other words, even though he had a fully functioning mathematical understanding of the problem, his algorithmic understanding, his ability to use the specific algorithm that the school had taught him was where he was failing. The school did not encourage him to the fact that he could understand, could do the problem by, without, uh, without using the algorithm just in his head was never used in this. He, he knew there was school math, which he can't do, and there's market math, which he can do, even though they're identical. They were, he, they were separated in his mind as being two different categories because in school math, there is always a process that you're supposed to follow to do them. And if you don't follow that process, then you are getting it wrong. And he didn't understand the process and therefore that so now this is a clue to what's going on. Well, I think there are two things that are happening. And I think um, I'll say a little bit about why I believe this. One is that I think people are just teaching our entire model of teaching at some level is wrong in the sense that it's, it, it tends to emphasize a very specific algorithm for learning everything. There is, here is the set of steps you do and that, that's how, how you get the right answer. Now, algorithms are good things, they're efficient, but if the algorithms don't, if they function just to, to reduce the confidence of the children, if, they, if you are told that whatever you think, if you don't follow the algorithm, you're wrong, then of course the children lose confidence, they don't use the skills they have. So these market children had the skills to do the mathematics, they, but they didn't have the confidence to do it. And the second, which is a related issue, which is what we call the tyranny of the curriculum. The children are, there is a very clear, this is related to the algorithmic approach, there's a clear set of things you're supposed to learn at any point of time. Those are not responsive to what the kid can or cannot do. So if the kid is unable to read, you still teach him history. You don't teach him how to read because he's in fifth grade. In fifth grade, nobody learns reading. In, in fifth grade, you learn uh, history or social studies or, or uh, science. So the fact of our curriculum, and this is not, it's not accidental. Um, it's, um, it's 
before one, it's true everywhere in many other countries. In France, for example, they're very proud of the fact that any given day, in any school in France, they teach the same curriculum. Now, despite the fact that some people in France are you know, from elite families and could read at the age of four, other, others are from families where you know, the parents are barely literate. And somehow that bridge is never uh, to be bridged. Uh, so, but all, I, it, it, it comes from, in India, for example, particularly the, the, uh, the uh, Right to Education Act actually requires that you complete the curriculum. That's part of the requirement of the Right to Education Act. It doesn't matter if kids are not learning, but you can complete, you have to complete the curriculum. This was when we, when we started to work with the government health uh, education system, the major stumbling block was teachers say, not saying teachers saying, you know, yes, uh, you know, you're wrong. We we should do uh, we we do what we should do. Uh, we we're doing the right thing, and you're just wrong. They were saying yes, you're. Uh, we notice that children don't learn, but we are required to complete the curriculum. That is the requirement, and they're right. They're required to complete the curriculum. So what do you do about it? So I'll take another. Uh, I'll go till five past three my time. That's uh, seven thirty-five your time, so that I. Make yeah, that's perfect. Time. That's perfect, Professor Manager. Okay, so one teach at the right level. This is the idea, an idea that Pratham has developed over many years. Start, and it's it's a very simple idea. You, but it's still an idea that is very hard to implement in a. A, a school classroom. So it's the, it's, it starts by saying in any classroom, there are children with very different skills. So you start by assessing them, not assessing them at some level, which is most of them can't reach, which is what we usually do in most low, low income schools. Children are assumed that, you know, they will fail. So let's assess where they are, not do they reach an unreasonable standard or an impractical standard? Then sort them into groups by learning levels. In fact, what they recommend doing is do that across grades. So if there's a fifth grade child who reads at first grade level, put him with the first grade kids who read at first grade level. And uh, if a first grade child reads at fifth grade level, put him with the fifth grade kids. So to build from where they are, and then build those basic skills and do, do that in a flexible way. It's very important is that it's not, a, it's not tracking, it's not putting children into different tracks. You are, you are a smart child, you're a dumb child. This is, this is done on a daily or weekly basis. This, this week we're going to focus on learning the skills. So you, you go to this classroom, Another week, you may be much better at something else, and we we keep you together. And sometimes it's usually done within the day, but sometimes, you know, across with across the week, so that children are not tracked. They're not classified as being, you know, smart or stupid. They are they are classified as being. You don't know this, so you should learn that. So that's quite important in the way to think about it. They've been working on this for many years, I, uh, at least from 2000. In 2000, uh, Pratham came up with the Balsagi program, which was a pullout program where uh, which a common community volunteer with basically a class 10 degree would pull out children from the classroom and help them catch up with whatever skills they had. Um, they, moved to a village volunteer-based program uh, that uh, then uh, again was out of school in the evenings, village volunteers work with children to catch up. Um, they, they did a version of it which, which was in, in, uh, in schools, uh, but in the summer we're using teachers from the government school itself. So this is not a matter of the teachers Competence is a matter of the teacher's attitude. What's the teacher thinks of his, as his job? He's able to teach uh, children basic skills. He doesn't do it because he's 
he sees his job as not that. Uh, this is then this is combining volunteers and uh, then there are versions of the same idea in Ghana. In uh, this is now teacher-led model in with um, in schools in Haryana and uh, finally uh, a, a kind of a, a, a very um, an in and out model. Basically, you go to the school, you spend short amount of time working there, um, you help children catch up, and then then you move on. So there are various versions of this. Um, so I'll just tell you about the last one, where which we did a, a study of uh, of uh, uh, this particular model, the, the Pratham's uh, staff volunteer model, this in and out model in UP, and we found that basically this led to both Hindi and math did lead to uh, an increase of basically children covered the. 70% of the gap between the bottom child and the middle child. So a lot of the bottom children caught up to the middle. And uh, another way to say it is UP is behind Haryana in learning levels. After this program, after this total of 40 days, they were caught up. So it's not, in other words, it's both what's sad about in the place we are now is that somehow um, we know that is our children can learn. It's not that we have some innate deficiency which is Im impossible to rectify. Children can learn. They, teachers can teach them to learn. They, they don't do it. Yes. And, why, wh wh and this particular idea that you should teach at the right level, teach at children's level, now you see implementations of that as you see all over the world, in India, but also in West and East Africa. Um, this, so in a sense, the reaction to this has been a lot to say, well, maybe we need to just work outside the school system. This is very relevant right now because we are talking a lot about you know, using the digital mode. Um, I think there is lots of potential for this. I think there's a very nice experiment with a, a company called MindSpark, which basically provides tutoring for children, out of school tutoring for children, showing that when you, when you provide this tutoring, which is sort of uh, very flexible, it adjusts to children's level of learning for older children in, in fields like science uh, and other fields as well, you get uh, very large gains. So children catch up fast if you, if, you, if you invest in. The problem is mostly that it's, this is a workaround. It depends on children volunteering to get the education outside school. The schools are the right place to do it. If we have to change the model of learning, we need to change it in the schools. We can't just sort of provide them with supplementary tutoring outside because not all children will get it. In fact, the more privileged or the more uh, children with the more engaged parents will get it. If you want to really uh, change things, we have to do it everywhere. And I think then we have to think about um, wh why is it that, for example, parents are not that you know, why don't children, when these opportunities are opened up, when children are offered some tutoring out of school, which will help them catch up, why are parents not interested? What is it that's stopping us from implementing what seems like a sensible solution in schools? So why is the teachers can teach, the children can learn, why is it not happening? And I think uh, the, at the core of this is a, a, a debate between, I think, two po points of view. One says there is an absolute level of knowledge that's critical. Uh, and if you don't have that absolute level of knowledge, then in some sense, education isn't worth it. Education is about reaching a particular level. This is a global level of learning that we need to aim for. And that you hear that all the time in the political discourse about education, about the global, you know, how we need to compete in the global marketplace. There is, and whenever you talk about 
you know, children are, are falling behind, they need to be taught what they need to learn. The, the pushback is often exactly that, which is that, and that comes from parents, comes from teachers, which says that, look, but that won't get them to IIT. They won't get uh, them to uh, whatever, the elite, to TIS. They, this, is, this is where they're going, to, they're going to fall behind. And I think this idea of an objective standard that education allows us to reach, and maybe it's going to be a few of us who'll reach it, but the rest, rest, it's sort of hopeless for them one way or the other, is, is I think at the core of this, and everybody buys into it. The parents buy into it, the, children, the teachers buy into it, the children buy into it. They all see themselves as failing if they don't get to that. At some fundamental level, I think that's at the core of the problem. We need to change the entire language of, of, uh, of uh, how we talk about education. Not that we have to have global skills, but primarily education is about making us able to learn. Then we can learn. And it doesn't matter how much content we have learned. It's really, um, I think, school systems that are successful actually are typically much less content focused than ours. Finland, to take a good example, is one that is almost entirely skill focused. If you don't have the skill, it it sort of doesn't matter. Content doesn't matter, is irrelevant. I think I think the idea that we should move away from content and towards you know everybody having basic skills is so radical that even though the new economic education policy opens up that possibility, it kind of draws away from it. It does say in basic skills in low grades, but then we're going to move away from it. I think in the pandemic, people have started to think about this. I see uh, uh, in Delhi, for example, uh, after the pandemic, there was this, I think, clear idea that we shouldn't necessarily um, finish the curriculum. And so I think there is some people are starting to see that maybe it's necessary to move away from that. It's, I think there is lots and lots of uh, possibility. Poss I think what is encouraging is that I don't think it's a difficult challenge. I think it's a doable challenge. It doesn't require, you know, wonderful infrastructure. It doesn't require, you know, teachers who all went to TIS. It doesn't, doesn't require, uh, you know, uh, billions of dollars, it requires a focus on the right outcome. And I think if we can focus on the right outcome and the democratic mindset that goes with it, which is the idea that everyone deserves to be able to have the basic skills and then what they'll make of that will vary, but that's what we really want is every, every child is learning well, to quote Pratham. Going back to a uh, pandemic, I think we're going to, re we, we really need to f allow for the fact that we're going to see even bigger differences among children. The children are going to be more homogeneous, heterogeneous now than they were before. And that means we need to really think of mechanisms which don't focus on getting them, you know, giving them the same content right now. I think that's, it's critical that we think about what this has done to what was already a, a big problem. And if we do, then I think we will be able to deal with it. If we don't, we're going to exacerbate a problem that already exists. So I'm, I'm going to, um, so I think that this is, we're actually at an interesting point. We're at a point where with the new education policy, with some more flexibility in the thinking, there is a possibility of us opening up new possible, uh, new dimensions, but I think we could also miss this bus. So I, I, I feel that all of us need to be engaged. This is a time to fo follow um, Professor Kothari's tradition of become, of all of us who are in the academic world to be a bit more activist, to, 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 to not let this moment pass because if it does, it will, it will scar a whole generation. I'll stop there, thank you. What a, what a sublime uh, ending, Professor Banerjee. I must congratulate you for reminding us uh, the great words uh, of Professor Kothari that in this world, in this world that the world we have made of our own sweat and blood, we need to be moving towards a more equitable and a human education.
thank you very much once again for giving us uh, you know you know uh, probably you know from my perspective and perspective uh, from the test perspective you have really brought uh, you know back child to our democratic imaginary and democratic imaginary mm -hmm. and social imaginary thank you very much uh, before we open up uh, you know interaction for the audience uh, uh, here our chairman you know mr ramadurai sir who has done tremendous work uh, in terms of you know democratizing skill based education and this has benefited hugely from that so i would like you know um, our said uh, chairman said ramadurai sir to you know reflect on your talk and perhaps you know lead us into the conversation with audience and interactions and professor salim bharati and certainly who has faced you know she is in the hot seat uh, in the pandemic and she has faced uh, you know how to leverage uh, and take us to a different world and, and different level of educational excellence thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you professor banerjee again i think the problems and the potential solutions which you articulated and with the integration with the new education policy and you club that with the uh, reflection time we had thanks to the covid I hope both the policy makers and the implementers on the ground adopt some of the recommendations which are coming out purely on the basis of data and not on the basis of hearsay or perceptions i think all of us carry that burden of responsibility to ensure that uh, data is king and honest data is more important than just voluminous data and then application of the interventions using the data is going to be the core if we want to proceed in a equitable society going forward with those remarks i'll be more interested in hearing the questions and suggestions from the people which will be beneficial to all again thank you so much uh, professor banerji and thank you professor ashwini kumar and uh, shalini bharji to organize this uh, webinar thank you so much thank you madam bharat you know professor bharat kindly you know. uh, uh, thank you professor banerji for this really very interesting talk and um, mm -hmm. i can't um, thank you enough for uh, you know uh, giving the spotlight on the skill sets learning skill sets rather than completing the curriculum uh, because that was a challenge in the covid times that when we went online uh, the challenge was about you know will we be able to complete the curriculum will we be able to do xyz and i think we really made a very conscious decision that you know let us not be chasing the curriculum let us try and Uh, make sure that there is academic continuity and there are skill sets to be learned in each of the courses rather than you know uh, think about doing as though uh, covid was not there because we were to uh, we accepted that there is a covid you know happening outside the pandemic is for real and so we should not try and attempt being in a normal time and i think this is uh, your talk has brought out this very well that you know uh, what is important is the skill sets Uh, i too would be very interested in listening to you know what the q and a session is just to uh, flag one issue with you and maybe not really expect you to answer just now that uh, while we talk about uh, you know doing something about the classrooms and uh, you know students the market uh, students and the school students uh, what do you think about you know uh, how do we orient and how do we develop uh, teachers for this kind of an approach uh, because the teachers i think are uh you know what shall i say prisoners of this whole uh, education system and i guess uh, it's not just about doing something with policy makers and i mean in the sense of the classroom but the the mindset of the teachers and their training and their uh, you know curriculum for the teachers itself but i wouldn't uh, want you to uh, uh, let me say one thing about that because there's some work we just finished in uganda it's well it's we finished and it continues and it's about exactly the, the addressing the question you are asking which is how to change the teachers attitude towards their own own teaching and learning and it's a curriculum developed by uh, it's called the PSA cartic curriculum and it's about spending teachers spending time with what they call a a, a tutor who's someone who basically doesn't teach them any content just 
makes them say, think, how do you know this? How do you know this? How do you know this? Why do you believe that? So keep challenging them to answer those questions. And that curriculum we show has massive effects on every, on every subject, basically. Uh, if you do that for, to the teachers, uh, for, um, they basically 10 days, three times a year, so 30 days of total training. They, the children perform, the, the, the pass rate in the Ugandan uh, government exam goes up by, by 50%. So the children are just so much better at uh, at uh, at uh, learning because I think they they are now not told that they are you know if they don't know the answer to something they are stupid they're told you know this is how you find out I think that particular key shift between sort of content is your uh, is the beginning and the end and content is just a means to inspire you to discover things. I think that that's a critical move that can be taught. I'm now convinced. It's just a matter of, we need to start there. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, it's very good to know from you from across different cultures. Uh, as a psychology student, I also know that uh, we realize that children of a carpentered world look at things very differently from children of a non-carpentered world. But that doesn't mean there is a difference in their intellect. It's just that they are in two different contexts. Uh, anyway, um, over to you. So please open up, you know, uh, 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 question answer session here and allow, you know, the people and the students uh, and our colleagues to, you know, raise questions or have discussions with Professor Banerjee. Professor Banerjee, I'm getting a question from across uh, across the country. And the question, the lead question I will share with you is about equity, is about equity, you know. How do you look at equity, you know, through experimental research, you know? So when you bring back child, you know, to the center of democratic education, how do you deal with the equity? At this, you know, as known for, you know, combining rigor with equity. So people are asking this question. In some sense, equity is built into the idea of, I think the, our presumption of our education system is that it needs to be inequitable. I think that is the presumption that, you know, some people will win and some people will lose. That the point of the education system is to select the winners. That's, that's how we were taught in school. I must say my school was completely dog eat dog. And it was a place, the entire culture was focused on uh, win, finding winners. And in the, indeed they would kick out the losers from the school, there would be just asked to leave. So that was, it, was a, it, was, it was entirely based on the idea that the point of a school system is to, attract, is to select the winners. I think that fundamentally is uh, at the core of our problems. Our core of our problem is, uh, the, uh, is somehow the idea that, um, and this is not, a, it's not crazy because it comes from the colonial, uh, a colonial system which really didn't want to have too many educated Indians. It wanted just enough in educated Indians that they could be the clerks and the petty government officials and not too many because too many Indians, educated Indians was trouble. So I think we all, we were always given um, a mandate which was of the, for, you know, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't pass too many people. If you pass too many people, we're going to get into trouble. This, or we should find, we, and we constantly do that. We constantly in, introduce new exams to qualify for things, just to make to clear to serve as gatekeepers. We are, we are sort of our our education system is so focused on gatekeeping, on making sure that not too many people show up at some place and say that well, give us the job or whatever. So we, we make them fail so that they are not, not, not in tro it, it, um, causing trouble for us. I think our entire system needs to first acknowledge that, you know, the gatekeeping function and, and educating a, a citizen of a democratic country are two, just two different functions. I think we are, we're, equity is centrally, a central concern in all of this. Thanks. Uh, Professor Banerjee, I'm getting a you know, whole lot of questions that I'm putting together and, uh, you know, summarizing for you. Uh, <laughs> Chavi, Chavi, you know, I can't see her location, but 
see, you know, asking this question about uh, local language, you know, I, I'm, I'm told that you come from multiple, you know, cultural backgrounds, you know, uh, you know, half Bengali and half Maharashtrian, if I'm not wrong. So yeah. how do we, how do we, you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, in the most serious, uh, on the serious note, how do we look at, you know, this whole idea of local language and uh, tell me that's what she is asking and address the issue of disparity, you know, in learning outcomes of children. I think there is a, a fair amount of evidence that, that um, children le learning um, that you know learning a, a, a second language from very young age is not necessary. I think you can you can if you have a strong grounding in what you have learned, then you can learn other languages later. I think that there is fair amount of evidence for that. There is there is evidence that you know if you start children with them with learning in their mother tongue, then they transition fine to other things. You don't need to learn English at the age of four. So I mean, I, I on the other hand, I think that's a place space where I think the politics is uh, very much against that. I think the most parents seem to believe that English is extremely valuable and it's uh, it's marketed by private schools as we're giving you better education as we're giving you English. I, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question because that's one of the most difficult challenges of the time. One, almost one that's so difficult that I'm not clear that I want to take it on. If I had to win one battle, I would probably give up on this one, uh, you know. I probably take it from... Please don't give up the battle, you know, we will lose the hope. But it is, this is a very hard one because I, yeah, mean, yeah. Before I talk to parents, which, you know, in the education work, you talk a lot. Their obsession is with English, English and computers. These are the two things you hear. You don't hear, like, I want them to learn Hindi or, yeah. uh, or Bangla. They hear, you hear them say, computers and English. That's, the, uh, that's always the question. So I don't know how far one can go in a democratic system to push back against that. So I, I'm, I'm, it's an interesting question. I don't have a strong, uh, I don't have a strong view on exactly where we should go because I think it's so difficult to negotiate. Parents, if you don't give them English, they drop out and they send their children to bad private schools. So you, you have this, uh, ecosystem where it's difficult. Pro yeah. Professor Banerjee, you have referred to, I'm getting a question from um, Milly Sill. Uh, uh, she is raising this issue of, you know, the distinction between market children and school children. So what is the politics, you know, any thoughts on, you know, market children and school children? And do you think that the, uh, this is a binary or, uh, or this binary gets blurred in the real life? Well, it's not, a, I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's just a happenstance that it's a binary. I don't think even think that these should, I think these children, what is interesting about the market children is that typically, as they were explaining to us, they think themselves as being less capable than school children. It's their self-discrimination that, you know, they're actually better than the school children. If you put them in a, if I had to hire one of them to do work for me, I would hire one of the, market children, they're, they're more alert, they're more able to deal with uh, issues that are, uh, are um, more, more able to deal with issues that are um, sort of more flexible. So I don't think, I think the self-discriminate, but we teach them to self-discriminate. We teach them to, to think of themselves as being inferior to the, to the school children. They are, as they, as they told me, um, if I were, able to do these school problems, I would be in school. They're able to do it, but they don't know that they're able to do it because we, our school system kind of conspires to make them less confident. Professor Banerjee, I'm getting this question from Bengal, you know, um, uh, you are deeply rooted into Bengal, uh, you know, being cosmopolitan as well. Uh, what, is, what is this, you know, distinction, you know, because students are raising this question, general public and parents are this raising question about the, public and private education, public and private school, you know. What is your preference, you know? Or is, the, you know, because you, you you always talk about uh, through your experimental research, positive nudge and negative nudge, you know. So how to, 
you know, nudge parents back to a more democratic, you know, school system. I, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I, um, I would say that the, the, current, the ch challenge of the education system right now is, I to be honest, I think the, the, the private public distinction is overplayed in the conversation because it's really not, both, both systems are failing. And in some sense, we, we sort of think of this private as being somehow better, but in fact, both are failing. I think, we're, and where they're failing, they're failing in the same place. They all represent, uh, sort of embody this elitist view that the success of the few is all that matters. And that, that's the reason why all of them fail. So I, I, at some level, I, don't, I think that's not the question I'm most interested in. I'm more interested in, in how to get all schools to move towards a more democratic mindset. Uh, uh, Mr. Saradip Banerjee was based, uh, you know, at Philadelphia Temple University, and one of the pillars of Kotari Lecture Series. He wants to raise a question or yeah. a little comment on that. I think uh, you and Professor Kartik Murdil Dharan have uh, emphasized that school infrastructure really doesn't matter in learning outcomes, but in terms of how politicians emphasize on infrastructure, it seems that selling infrastructure to the general mass is probably more saleable than other issues like school curriculum. So why do you think politicians and governments spend so much on in infrastructure and so little on other things which really matter in improving learning outcomes? To be honest, I don't even know that there's much that they need to spend on. I think if they use the same resources differently, that would be fine. I, I, I don't, it's really not a problem of resources. It's a problem of just misdirected uh, sort of energy, a lot of energy is used to do things that don't need doing and, and conversely not doing the things that need to be done. So I, I, I don't think the challenge is one of, of, uh, of um, getting, getting uh, uh, I think the government should basically, in some sense you start to see that, you start to see that governments actually, a bunch of states, governments are shutting down the tiniest schools and try to uh, consolidate them. And I, I, I think that's, to, to be honest, I think that's probably a good thing that we, we, should, we should try to, um, because very small schools are very difficult to sustain. The kids don't have people to play with. And uh, so I, I'm not sure, I, I, I think infrastructure is, it's, the problem is that, you know, uh, it's, it does give you a ribbon cutting opportunity. But I think right now, I see that mostly happening at the higher, the higher education level is totally dominated by that. This, you know, we have to have an IIM and an IIT in every state, whatever the quality is. I think, I think, I think the idea that somehow, uh, and that ribbon cutting of a very glamorous kind is, is a valuable political act it is clearly there. But I, I think in primary schooling right now, the government isn't building so many schools actually. It's, it's more, so I think that that's less of an issue. I think the idea of what, what it does do is a lot of teacher training that doesn't do very much. I think there is better teacher training available. That's what I was telling uh, Professor Bharat. Um, but I, I, I think there is, a, yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm less concerned now about infrastructure. I think computers is the next infrastructure obsession. And again, computers without a particular pedagogical purpose don't do anything. They're a waste of money. I think our chairman is listening, you know, very seriously. And I'm sure he has an answer to this problem. Uh, Professor Banerjee, I'm still, you know, struggling with hundreds of questions. Would we would do that, we will send you, you know, the compile the question, send it to you for uh, you I'm know, sure your perusal at your, right. yeah, at your, you know, we don't want to burden you with, you know, hundreds of questions, but certainly, you know, as a responsible academic, uh, I would do my exercise. But before, you know, I close this interaction and audience questions, uh, there are two things that I'm getting from the question bank here. Is one, you know, how about, you know, what Martha Nussbaum famously spoke about, you know, the crisis of liberal arts question. And secondly, you know, from my point of view, you know, um, as, as a writer and as a poet, uh, and a literary mind here, uh, you know, who writes in English, you know, unfortunately or fortunately. Uh, is there any future for Santi Niketan like, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, social imaginary or educational imaginary? 
let me not skip the uh, they're related let me skip martha's uh work and uh, i i do think that partly the mistake we make often is somehow th thinking about the world as being you know there was there was a some uh, time for the liberal arts and now there's time for technology and i think this this is extraordinarily corrupting i think all the forgive me for those of you who are facebook fans all the when you, you listen to the conversations with people like zuckerberg you realize that their cluelessness about how society works about how culture functions is critical to their self justification they want to they they think they are fixing society when they're breaking it and i think i think that's a i think we need i think the more technology gets powerful the more we need um institutions like shantinika and a more general uh, commitment to uh, liberal uh, arts thinking I, i i couldn't emphasize that more thank you thank you Pro uh, professor banerjee and uh, before i invite uh, our dean professor ritamra have to give formal uh, express thanks uh, for your talk uh, i must come back and share my last you know poetic line once again from jivananand das who said that and it applies to your professor banerjee and i picked up especially for you go where you will professor banerjee i'm i'm using jivananand go where you will i shall remain on bengal so shall see you plucking jackfruit leaves dropping in the dawn's bridge professor tan i invite professor vitamra wow actually that should be the that should have been the conclusion but <laughs> <laughs> anyway um thank you so much uh, professor kumar um on behalf of the faculty staff and students uh, of the school of development studies and the institute i express our gratitude to professor abhijit banerji for delivering this insightful talk as a part of the rajni kothari lecture series his talk has uh, brought up a number of issues to ponder over especially the enduring question of social experiments and their efficacy in changing the conditions of life among the poor at the core of the discussion and I, and uh, what i relate with is the need to democratize the thinking on education in india primarily by listening to people and understanding the context that shaped their choices and life chances it was indeed an honor to hear professor banerjee and interact with him our endeavor at the school has always been to make our students uh, realize to quote uh, henry david thoreau that dreams are the touchstones of our character the intellectual journey and extraordinary achievements of professor banerjee exemplifies the spirit and is an inspiration to all your presence here professor banerji has kindled many aspirations and dreams for that and for sharing your discerning views on education in india a big thank you thank you it's a, uh, it's a rare privilege to have a chairman uh, mr ramadora as a part of the special event and we thank him for gracing this occasion with his presence our director professor charlie bharat has always encouraged us in all our activities we are deeply touched by this professor bharat and are truly fortunate to have your continued support I also want to express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Ashwini Kumar the curator of the Professor Rajni Kothari lecture series and for this very special event that will remain etched in the institutional memory of SDS and the institute without the enthusiasm and hard work of the conveners the student organizing team the SDS staff which includes Vishreya Raju Sheetal and Prajakt I'm scared I'll miss out someone and all our students this event would not have been possible despite many responsibilities and challenges of working remotely your commitment to such events is encouraging so thank you for that here i would specially like to thank mr sivakumar systems manager from the computer center and of course his team for providing the technical support and for his reassuring presence throughout the program last but not the least we at sds thank our distinguished guests and all our participants we are grateful and humbled by the overwhelming response to the event thank you so much for being here thank you so much and once again thank you professor banerji it's just been completely you know, a fantastic experience thank you professor bharat will extend you on a formal invite to come to institute in the post covid world thank you <laughs> in that world which you would like all like to be in thank you thank you in that hope thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
once again and Professor Prof. Prof. Banerjee. Need some time. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.